And yeah, so thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, we know that a lot of families in our network and um, across the city are really worried about the district budget situation and how it's gonna impact their families. So we invited Anne-Marie Gordon and Kirstie Yee Finley from the SFUSC budget team to give us some context and background about the budget issue and to share a plan they're working on to ensure that every dollar that we do spend on staffing, uh, which is like obviously a big part of the budget is effective and a good use of um, our money. So love to pass it off to um, Anne-Marie to share a little bit more. Awesome, thank you for the introduction and hi everybody. Um, it's nice to, to see you all and to have some time uh, to share all of that information with you all today. I think, um, and just to confirm, do you already have the slides included here or should I share my screen or share um, the deck you should with you? share your screen okay. or you guys think you may not have permission to, or no, you you can share it right now if we uh, remove it. Ah, um, I, I do not have permission actually. Okay, you can share it uh, with me. The slide deck? Mm -hmm. Okay, do that real quick. Right, what is your email address? Um, it's just Giovanna at sfparents.org. Okay, it is going to you now. Um, and uh, also just to confirm, I didn't quite see on the agenda, the goal is about 20 minutes for this topic, right? Yeah, I think uh, for okay. the presentation. It's right, like, um, you know, up to what, what makes sense for the discussion and, you know, what people are wanting to talk more about, but got it. Yeah, okay. Around awesome. That. Well, yeah, presentation should be in your inbox and yeah. So, um, I, I am an executive director in business services and have worked in the budget office and in business services more broadly with SFUSD for over six years. Um, and so the presentation as we go through the slides are, are oriented to um, specifically implementing a staffing model. And I do want to focus on that um, to the extent that I can, because that that is part of where, you know, my role this year is developing this and making sure that our planning aligns with um, our planning aligns with, you know, the district's vision and also has meaningful input from the community on what that vision looks like in action. Um, but we'll also um, add some notes about some of the budget updates as we go. I know that that's an area that um, that you all are interested in. And I think we have some, right, we have some sort of updates that are in development right now. So I'll try to, to balance those. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. So, where we're gonna to start today is um, to reflect on the rationale and goals of implementing a staffing model compared to our current budget process. And then the discussion and the Q&A will be sort of time permitting and based on what makes sense for you all an opportunity to, you know, to discuss, to ask questions, but also have um, an opportunity to talk about you know, values, priorities, things that are really um, coming to mind and feel like they should be elevated from your perspective. Next slide, thank you. Okay, and then we can go to the next one. Um, so the first few slides are a little bit of background on budget context overall. Um, so this um, this is actually going back to our adopted budget. Here. And basically at that time, we were both trying to plan, right, plan thoughtfully for the new year, had gone through our budget development process, and were in the midst of negotiations with multiple labor partners. And so at the time of our recommended budget, we really wanted to anchor our path forward in principles based on feedback we've received from the California Department of Education about making sure that we are being responsible with our funding, 
and also recognizing that we wanted to be able to bargain right in good faith and be able to make meaningful commitments to labor. And so we presented these new budgeting principles, uh, not completely new concepts, but new areas of focus. Um, so making sure that when we right when we're planning our budget, we're really thinking about our restricted funding first because that's where right that's where we really have to be specific about our plan and align with restrictions um especially as we've over the past few years received lots of different types of state and federal funding some of it stimulus funding from covid some of it learning recovery to help right recover from the pandemic um and some additional um other one time or short term funding sources um we also you know, need to continue making steps towards towards that concept of right sizing or aligning what we do with with the size of our district. And so that is both our, you know, our enrollment capacities, our budget, and our staffing expectations, um, and making sure that we're really being strategic and thoughtful about how we how we plan, knowing that we've had some vacancies, but ultimately we do want right, those services in place at schools. So um, so we sort of started with this of like, here are some areas that are going to guide our path forward uh, into, this, into this school year. Next slide. The other thing that we saw and that we, you know, we shared as an observation is that um, when we compare ourselves to other districts in California, we see some patterns. Uh, where we have low staff to student ratios, we have more schools and our schools tend to be smaller uh, compared to other districts. And we also have more specialized programs, things like language pathways, um, high, right, small high schools or high schools of choice. And to be clear, these things, like none of these things are bad. You could argue actually that all of these things are good. Um, the challenge we then face is that with all of these different investments and we haven't always seen that these investments directly translate into the student outcomes that we aspire to and these kind you know having you know high levels of staff many small schools many programs those all those all right have costs. And so what happens is that we have then fully utilized our budget and we don't have the ability, for example, to increase salaries because we've really fully committed our budget within these other investments. And so we were really kind of juggling or trying to think about how to balance these priorities and how we move forward. Next slide. So the final, I think the final piece of this context was that we also, um, we also, the board adopted goals and guardrails um, around how we would be right, orienting our investments, organizing our work as a district to support students and making sure that we are doing so, you know, in processes, like with processes that are respectful of the, of the public. And so guardrail four around resource allocation specifically says that the superintendent will not allow resources to be allocated without transparently communicating how the allocations are baseline sufficient to operate all schools while addressing inequitable inputs and creating more equity and excellence in student outcomes. And there was a particular sort of call out about identifying the ideal staffing model for each grade level bands by this coming February for next year and beyond. So, um, so right, all of this together was like, we really need to be, you know, very deliberate about how we are planning and looking at the state of the district so that we can use our resources in a way that are going to provide right provide high quality services to students right create positive experiences in schools um and be fiscally responsible which is right all of that together can be a bit of a tall order but what this led to was the the thinking that 
we want to really be more consistent and clear about the resources that are going to schools um, so that we can right, move in the direction of transparent allocations and really being able to, as a district, understand like how what we are doing collectively and across every school um, to achieve our goals for student for student learning and success. Next slide. So there's a lot of information on this slide um, and it is it is meant uh, to be a little bit overwhelming uh, if you're unfamiliar with some of these nuances of school funding. Um, because that is part of the sort of part of the challenge that the staffing model development is attempting to solve. So what you see here is that our, our current approach, right, the pie chart represents many of the many of the allocations that schools receive in their budget each year. You can see there's a lot of different layers, a lot of different roles, a lot of different right typed ways that funding can come to a school. And while, again, that isn't at face value a bad thing, it does result in an uneven experience for students and families from school to school, from school level to school level. Um, and that can make it really challenging to then talk about what we are doing, you know, consistently across the district or really even have a common vision for what a student's experience is. Because as you look at this pie chart, where we have multiple different components of a school's budget, which is a combination of dollars, a combination of positions, uh, right? Different criteria for how all of these things come to your school. It means that the story for every school is different. And so, and as you can see in that box on the right, things vary year to year, even sometimes based on very small fluctuations in enrollment. So the thinking was, we want to be more clear about the guarantee for every student and the guarantee for every school and think about ways to simplify this so that we can use our resources in really the most strategic way possible. Next slide. So here we have the, um, we have the sort of premise of a staffing model as compared to our current sort of combination of strategies for school funding. Right? We want to clearly articulate the staffing and services that are allocated to each school. We want that to be rooted in our equity vision and also tied to criteria, eligibility, and funding um, based on a number of different things. And so for anyone who's familiar with some of our school funding methods, you'll see that there are still aspects of those in the staffing model, but the idea is that we want to create one sort of comprehensive, um, you know, method or mechanism, um, rather than having many that all can write those rules and criteria can change um, or fluctuate in less predictable ways. So the numbers on the right are basically the different um, thinking about the different ways that we will that we want to think about staff funding and how schools are designed and supported. So one is school size and level. So for example, right, level means like elementary, K-8, middle and high. Um, and then, you know, where are there differences between a small high school and a large high school? Are there differences? Sometimes there are and sometimes there are not. Student characteristics really do um, speak to the equity vision and our focal populations wanting to differentiate funding based on who our students are, um, which is both something that we have prioritized in our budget for a long time, and also is a requirement of the state where we receive differentiated funding for different uh, populations of students. So it's a combination of something that we're required to do, but something that we've really done more um, with our right with our resources to really bring equity to the forefront. And third, um, recognizing specific program offerings. So uh, in addition to, you know, how many teachers a school might need um, based on its size, based on the grade levels it serves, 
where are there specific programs that we want to ensure are offered at our schools, or if a school runs a certain program, maybe a language pathway or a particular content area, a particular school subject, um, we wanna make sure that schools are set up to run that program successfully. So, right, again, bringing all of those different varied things that we've currently sort of decentralized into a more centralized, um, you know, single model to so that we have the full picture in looking at resources that schools are allocated each year. Next slide. Um, okay, so we are we're almost done. We got two more slides uh, before we'll pause. But um, the these are the some of the the guiding principles uh, as we've thought about what the staffing model should be accomplishing, and really thinking about our, our that common vision of what we want um, schools to be able to do and how we want students to be served. So. One of those, um, one of those principles is really being clear about resources, both staff and dollars following students. Um, that is right. We really want our money to go where our kids are. And that is also speaks to the budget principle about aligning uh, what we're doing to our enrollment. We also want to prioritize strategies across all of our schools to help accomplish our, our goals of third grade around third grade literacy, eighth grade math, and college and career readiness. And so some of the strategies that we've been talking about are uh, ensuring that schools are fully able to have an instructional, like high quality instruction, and that they're they have an instructional leadership team that can really support teachers uh, <clears throat> improving uh, in their work and becoming really strong classroom teachers uh, that can write that tier one, like that first interaction, that direct interaction between a student and their teacher has the single biggest impact on a student's success in school. And then also recognizing um, that our coordinated care teams help us ensure that we're serving the whole child. So, you know, those those kinds of strategies are the things we're keeping in mind as we look at what a staffing model should, right, should contain in terms of, you know, the types of roles at a school. And then finally, um, this school should be able to choose supports that are most appropriate for their specific population. So this is where we're trying to balance right, some standardization and some differentiation across our schools, um, particularly when it comes to focal students um, and recognizing that schools understand the unique needs of their kids. And so that, that autonomy um, is really critical for a school to, you know, to be able to plan effectively uh, each year. Next slide. So final slide before we'll pause is um, the sort of the structure that uh, the staffing model is going to take. Uh, you can see up at the top, we have foundation allocations uh, that will be primarily based on school size and level. So this is where, right, it's you are a middle school of 600 students. Here is the set of staffing that any middle school of 600 students um, would need to be able to operate. You then layer in focal student allocations that would be, con you know, considering the specific students that enroll in that school. And we imagine that being a combination of some staffing, but probably mostly um, dollars that schools would choose how they're used. So they could be used for additional staff or they could be used for other types of intervention and support. And then the program and student service allocations are essentially based on you know, particular offerings. They may also adjust with the school size or the school level, um, but are more specific to right particular programs, content areas, and um, and aligned with how we will use some of our funding that is restricted to certain programs and types of supports. So, um, 
I will, I will, yeah, I'll pause there. Um, I think, right. The, the, we have some slides to, to, you know, to talk through prioritization and get feedback from all of you, but I think we can also pause here and, and just, yeah, have some discussion, answer some questions, uh, and hear your thoughts. Um, let's see, Julia, feel free to ask your question. Hi, um, thank you so much for the presentation. That's really helpful. Um, my name is Julia and I'm here with um, my colleague, Robbie. We are volunteers at Code for San Francisco and we're building a website to make it easier for people in the San Francisco community to donate to local schools. Um, so one thing we've been trying to help communicate on the website is um, budget discrepancies between the schools and PTA funding discrepancies between the schools. Um, I was just curious if you feel like the data that you have is publicly available and how easy it is for people in the community to really understand funding discrepancies and the budget. And like, it's just so complex, you know, the slide you shared. Um, like I have a master's in education and I still have to spend a lot of time on it. So I'm just curious, like in terms of the community outreach and communication piece, like how, are there any efforts on the budget side to just help explain that to people? Yeah, no, that is a great question. And, and I agree. I think it's right. We're a large district with a lot of different funding sources that all have different different rules and, and restrictions. So it, it definitely can be right, can be complex um, <clears throat> to go through all of it, especially if you're trying to look at every school. I think um, we do have we so we do have some resources on like that are on the SFUSD website. Um, for example, for like, um, right, our, our budget each year, we have a budget book that has some background information. Um, I see a comment about Tableau. Um, I think that's something that we probably aspire to bring back. I think we um, we weren't able to maintain it uh, the past couple of years as another way to kind of double click into the budget. Um, one, other, one other resource that is that's on the website that I think you have to look school by school, but can be very informative and helpful for understanding how all of our current like funding allocations work is um, we also, we post all of our school allocations on the website um, to the, to the public. And so if you're right, if you're curious about a particular school and why they get what they get um, their, their weighted student formula allocation, which is, Right, which is like a weight based it's enrollment and student characteristic based you can actually see like each weight in the formula how many students are projected that they'll have and what the weight is so you can see how it all rolls up um but that said we're also always open to feedback and looking for ways to provide information that is like helpful and digestible so if you have any recommendations or any feedback on things that would that would help, um, I would I would be happy to to hear them or you know feel free to to send me an email um, with any suggestions for what we can do better because it is an ongoing process to make sure that the budget feels accessible and transparent. Cool, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, I saw, Stephanie, that you had a question. Feel free to um, ask that, or we can also just, I can read it out for you. Sure, I can I can try to uh, mention this here. So I might be jumping ahead in the slides, but one of the things that I, I noticed is that uh, some of the funding, which um, we didn't have transparency around, which was, uh, which is, you know, more, more coming from central staffing, right, in the past uh, multi-tiered model. Um, it looks like some of that, if I understand correctly, might be disappearing or becoming potential, right? Things that, um, you know, we don't we don't have art at our school, we have to pay extra for art, but things like music, um, the 1P class a week, and library, is it accurate that some of those things are on the table right now in terms of cuts, um, given the current budget situation? Um, that's a great question, and I think has, has come up. So you're not jumping ahead, I think we can, like, 
any feel free to look at that and ask questions directly about it. So I think this has actually been one area where as we've been developing the model, we've been trying to figure out the right way to sort of put the pieces together, like build the blocks in a way that that allows us to right leverage, for example, restricted funding that we have, but also make sure that we're providing those baseline services. Um, I think maybe art would be arts and PE and libraries are a good example because we have um, the public education enrichment fund is a very large local fund that we get from the city each year. It's an annual allocation that um, right now is in the 90 to $95 million a year range. And half of that is specifically dedicated to sports, libraries, arts, and music. And so we also will use, you know, our unrestricted general fund dollars for, 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 for some of those roles, but that has been a really valuable and it is an ongoing funding source that allows us, right, to really bolster that programming. And so I think an example of maybe like high school, you know, high school art, um, like high school, you know, arts and music, uh, those the way that it typically works is that and the way it, it, we plan for it to work in the staffing model is that schools uh, in their foundation receive an allocation for the number of teachers uh, that we calculate they need so that students can have access to their full course load every day. That's going to cover content, you know, that covers all of their different subjects uh, that it would include arts and music, but we also plan to include like a program allocation because we know that like class sizes will vary a little bit. And so, uh, right, that's like a very into the granular, like how the allocations will work. But the idea is that will there will be a little bit of both um, and that the program allocation will give schools a little bit more autonomy in choosing exactly which courses they offer and how much. And just because just you mentioned high school, um, but how does that yeah. translate to an elementary school level? Yeah, so in elementary school, um, what we're looking at, we've used, I think we we have used primarily um, PEEF for many of those allocations. And so what we're looking at in, in that allocation is, right, what are, what, are the, what are the amounts of time that we're targeting for students to have in, right, if it's an hour of arts or music every week, then we're looking at how many classrooms are gonna be in that school, mm -hmm. um, right? How much time is needed for each of those classrooms to have an hour, then, you know, plus a little bit of buffer time because we know that every school has to work out its specific schedule. And then that would be the allocation. So we're making sure that those requirements are met and that will probably have a little bit of, of wiggle room there. Um, yeah, so, but again, it's that's a good question because we're having to kind of work through each of those different types of, right, classes and, and offerings to make sure that schools are going to get what, what they should have. Thank you. Reading now, Marie, um, why don't you, uh, there's a question sorry, about districts, and then why don't we um, pause Q&A there so you can get to the rest of your presentation. Okay. Um, so, okay, what peer school districts utilize this staffing model approach? Um, yes, so uh, most districts use a staffing model. Um, so weighted student formula has, this has been, this has been a, really, a, I think, a, a tough decision for us to make. We've had a weighted student formula for over 20 years, and um, in general, weighted student formula has been seen as a way to ensure that resources are allocated in an equitable way um, because, right, it is really built on a, like, by student, right, a weighted student formula. Um, but what we've seen is, is the, as, right, as we've had to deal with budget reductions and shrinking enrollment, the way the resources get pulled out of weighted student formula can have a harmful impact. And so that's why we've decided that a staffing model will allow us to really be clear about what we're guaranteeing and how we're differentiating funding um, for, you know, for different student groups. So I think, um, unfortunately, there isn't a lot, there isn't like a lot of 
of research on funding methodologies and like the impact of those methodologies on student outcomes because because it is like I think because there is a pretty long impact chain um, you think let's allocate the resources in a certain way we then need to think about what the planning process looks like um, for how those resources are going to get used right then are is that plan implemented um, and then you know and so so it does make it challenging to to draw that full through line in a research based way, um, but we are we are trying to you know to see what we can learn and and look at other districts to um, right to like set this up to be as successful as possible. Um, let's see. So I see a yeah comment about ERS. I know so. Um, and I'm just looking at the chat. I think this is the the idea of the remainder of our time. Um, and I want to be, you know, be aware of the time. What else you all have on the agenda for the meeting is basically to look at a couple of school profiles and have the opportunity to think about, based on these school profiles, what kinds of focal allocations or program and student services feel like they would be the most impactful. Um, we can definitely take time to do that. I'm also open to continuing the discussion and, you know, and using and, and encouraging everybody to, to fill out the community survey that we have out, which is another way for us to get input. So I'll, I don't know, I sort of want to get get a read from you all of what feels like it might be the best way to to use the time that's left. I would suggest that we move into uh, just the, like, I think there are some questions about what the proposed staffing models look like and then like how that compares to current schools, et cetera. So maybe if we can spend five minutes in that space and then kind of open it up for another round of Q&A. Okay. Okay. So I, I'll go over the slides, um, the next couple of slides and talk through what, yeah, what is in there about what we're talking about for the staffing model so far. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. So then, yeah, let's go, we'll go to the next slide then. And right. So this is um, essentially want to talk a little bit about, right, what we're imagining already in some of our foundation allocations, but then how we build um, the focal student and program allocations from there. Uh, also thinking about what, what we want to be, you know, consistent across every school or where we want there to be more of the opportunity for, right, school determination of how resources are used. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so we'll actually go ahead uh, for the sake of, basically this is just helping sort of frame, you know, the foundation, we're gonna see sort of a starting point for a foundation. And then we're gonna look at a school profile to talk more about what the focal and program student allocations would be. So um, next slide, uh, we have, so we have two examples. We have an elementary and a high school. And I think as we go, all we we wanted just two examples, so we, we didn't, you know, particularly, uh, you know, we didn't mean to exclude middle school. But one reason that we focused on elementary and high is because um, we've been in the process of implementing our Initiate Wonder staffing model for middle schools that actually began this year, and so we've had, you know, there's been a long uh, a long design process for that middle grades redesign, um, and so felt like for the purposes of discussion, having elementary and high here for reflection would be really valuable. So both slides have an example that is not that is based off of an SFUSD school, generally speaking. Um, you can see that this is, right, this is a relatively small elementary school with 216 students, um, transitional kindergarten through fifth grade. 85% um, of the school is focal students, about half are English learners and 10% have IEPs or individualized education plans. Um, and then in their student achievement, they're right, 
just over a third, 35% proficient on English language arts, SBAC, and 41 proficient on math. Um, on the right side of the screen, you can see right an initial um, version of foundation allocations, which are based on really right that sort of baseline sufficient uh, definition. And we have right, a principal, a clerk, or a management assistant, classroom teachers uh, based on our United Educators of San Francisco contract size. Um, this school has transitional kindergarten, so they also have a TK paraeducator to support that class. As a smaller school, uh, this site would most likely have a half-time nurse and a half-time social worker. Uh, and then noon monitors help with supervision of lunch and recess time, as well as non-personnel for materials and supplies, um, right, for, you know, extended hours for staff, you know, various needs um, that the school will have for their ongoing uh, operations. So then the next slide has our high school example, structured the same way. Uh, I'll talk through it quickly. The foundation's a little bit, a little bit different, but you can see that this is um, like a small to medium size, maybe high school of 500 students, 82% um, focal, 30% English learners, and 26% of students have IEPs. Um, and here we have, right, English language arts, 31% proficiency, and math is 8% proficient. The foundation is a little bit different in high school um, because it isn't, right, a classroom teacher in quite the same way that you get in elementary. So we calculate the amount of teachers the school needs based on average class sizes of 30 and knowing that teachers have a prep period every day. They have a full wellness center uh, staffing model already in place with a nurse, social worker, and community health outreach worker. And then based on right these different ranges of assistant principals, clerks, security personnel, and counselors, um, as a sort of small to medium sized school, I don't remember precisely, but this would be um, right probably two to three of the assistant principals or clerks and probably three counselors. Um, so as we move the next couple of slides are for reference, um, these, yeah, we can go to the next one. Thank you for your help. Um, so these are examples. These are not comprehensive lists, but examples of some of the focal roles that we've been thinking about um, for elementary. And then on the next slide is high school. And I think that to the question about some of these, right, librarian, arts and music, and PE, um, this is where we're, right, we're thinking, like, allocations will certainly be based on right required minutes um, and graduation requirements um, but any right any instances where we would want to like augment that beyond some of those requirements I think that's where you know feedback about you know program roles would be really helpful um, so we can go to the next slide and then the next one so this is right. This is the sort of the question of I know it's a lot of information and for a short, you know, for a, a relatively short amount of time, but in right thinking about for either elementary or high, you know, this, you know, these different profiles of schools um, and what we know they're going to have, what does it feel like should be prioritized above that? Um, and that can be a reflection on right, on what you all have experienced in, right, in, 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 in different schools, in different environments, um, really open and want to hear from you all. And I also can see that there have been some things going in the chat. So I'll pause here and open that up um, so we can dig in. Hey, Emery, um, yeah. Why don't you skip two slides ahead to the how we'll use your feedback? Um, okay. which is pretty much the end of the presentation. And then we'll use whatever time is left um, to open it up. Okay, great, yep, that one. Uh, 
So basically, uh, we will be, you know, synthesizing everything that we hear, right? Even right, clarifying questions, all of that. We'll be synthesizing it all um, to share with the proposal as we're working to finalize, uh, yeah, a proposal for the staffing model with cabinet and senior leaders. Uh, we also are will be presenting the staffing model in early 2024 to the board and a summary of the engagements and the feedback we received will be included. Um, and right, we'll also want to like share that back with everyone, um, how we've used this in really, you know, trying to be concrete and tangible of how these different discussions have directly informed um, where we're going. Okay, and I will, I'm gonna start reading the chat now. Um, Okay. Um, so, uh, so I see a question about scaling and reallocating central office staff. So this is, yeah, this is a great question. And um, as part of our overall um, budget balancing strategy uh, to, as we've right settled with all of our labor partners and are making sure that we can, that our budget balances as we incorporate those costs, um, there are there is a review and there there are going to be reductions to central office services. I think that over I also think that over time, um, increasing the connection between how central offices support schools and how that scales with the size of a school or the number of schools we have is something that would really I think would really help strengthen uh, the like clarity of who works in central office and why, right, what they do that's in support of schools. Um, so we, ha we haven't we uh, have made that like distinct explicit link at this moment, but we are moving forward with with um, like reviewing and, and, and making reductions to central office services um, to make sure that we, Right to make sure that everything we're implementing in the staffing model can be prioritized as as much as possible. Um, okay, consideration to actual numbers instead of percentages. Uh, yes, this is a great question and something we have been looking at a lot about, uh, like how allocations take place. So I think one example is with our focal students. Uh, with the focal student allocations, where we're looking at allocating per pupil, um, that's the way that we're doing it is by by looking at, for example, the number of English learners uh, that are in a school and allocating money per student. Um, I think that does help, right? That both ensures that we are allocating more per student for that 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 group of kids, and that you know we aren't saying, you know, if you have English learners, you get X amount of money or you get this staff person, but at larger schools, it means that, that it's harder for that person to actually work with all of the students they're intended to, to support. So um, that is, yeah, that is one that we're, we're still, it will also mean that as we implement the staffing models, some smaller schools may end up with a little bit less than what they've had. Um, I need a couple minutes. Uh, we'll have a little. We'll have a little bit less uh, than some of our current allocations will currently um, give them. But um, okay, next one: counseling ratio. Um, so the one to four hundred and fifty ratio is the, is what is in our union contract. Uh, but we recognize that a lower ratio is much more beneficial um, in practice. And so what we are currently planning to do, especially thinking about, right, second areas where high schools are, or where counselors are um, really placed or where they work is in addition, to, so the one to 450 ratio is our foundation, um, but then as a an additional student service allocation, we want to give every school an additional counselor and uh, high schools as part of their focal student, weighted student formula, um, will have then funding that could be used to lower that ratio even more. 
And so as we're, you know, as we're reviewing and finalizing, we're trying to kind of see what this would mean for each of our schools and whether the amount of staffing they get feels, you know, feels adequate or not. And we're, you know, adjusting as we go so that our final product um, will allow schools, right, to, to run effectively and serve students well. Um, okay, and is this, I is it helpful for me to just be going, running through all the questions? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's great, Anne-Marie, thank you. Okay, okay, great. Um, so the next one I see is uh, setting student-teacher ratios. So um, the state does set student-teacher ratios, but then we also, in our contract with United Educators of San Francisco, um, have have negotiated lower lower class sizes in kindergarten through third grade. And so that is part of why you can why the four or five ratio is higher um, is because we've specifically negotiated with with UESF a lower ratio for k through three. Um, and so we we abide by that ratio for k three and then the state the state ratio for fourth and fifth grade. Ah, and I see that Debbie also responded to answer that. So thank you. Um, and so, uh, oh, and then the the smaller classes in high school. So that average of 30 is because in our UESF contract, different subjects have different goals. Um, so like there's, you know, an, an English language, like an, an or a language arts class, the goal class size is 25. It's not a required number, but it's a goal. Whereas like physical education is a larger class size. And so we use 30 as the average, recognizing that there's gonna be some variability as we plan. Uh, for example, for maybe the number of English teachers that you need compared to a subject that can have slightly larger class sizes. Um, Okay, will consistency of staff and programming be part of this discussion? Um, would love to hear a little bit more about what that means. Sure, I, I'm happy to. My kids are at a smaller elementary school. And when we first started, we had a reading intervention specialist. We had a outdoor education program and uh, a couple of the things that were funded either through the district or, you know, one of the many formulas. As our student population has changed, especially drastically during the pandemic, we've lost a lot of staffing. And so kids like, I'm thinking of my son in particular, who doesn't fall into any of the focal group populations, but was still relying on, especially our reading intervention teacher, that has gone away. And so for kids that didn't get that opportunity, but they came to our school knowing that we were fully staffed at one point, now we're kind of stuck and you know i'm thinking of like our first and second graders who now don't they're here for until fifth grade but the programs that brought them to the school now can no longer be offered and i think as parents we're trying to decide where to send our kids for sometimes six years even as little as three or as much as four and the offerings if as they change year to year it makes it really hard to know what you're getting as a parent when you sign up and so i just wondered if the district is trying to keep um consistency especially of like intervention programs and social workers at the forefront as they're making these changes yes yeah no that's a great a great question and um and i think that yeah the, the short answer is that yes i think that's part of what we've seen has been the struggle is right even minor relatively minor changes in enrollment can sometimes require schools to make a big change to staff um and so that you know for the example of the 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 reading coach i think right now what we've been thinking about is really wanting to support all of our classroom teachers and really focus on strengthening our you know the the quality of instruction in all of our classroom teachers and so we've been right now we're thinking that um, looking at every school having, for example, a math or a literacy coach that would be specifically working with teachers, right? Thinking through like, and all of that. And so that would be right, regardless of school size, regardless of change in population, things like that. Um, 
and really then where there are allocations that change with a school's size um, that we're looking at grouping our school sizes that more based on like the total number of classrooms that a school has rather than number of students, because that can be a little bit, right, a little bit more finicky. Um, and so then, you know, if a school is experiencing larger change in their size, then you kind of see that happening and you understand how that translates rather than it being like, oh, those five students each from a different grade resulted in the loss of, right, a part-time social worker or something like that. So, um, okay, and I see a few people, yeah, awesome. mentioning um, that. Sorry. You're yeah, good. so just um, yeah. being mindful of time because we know like a lot of people are here um, just because of their, like through their lunch shift at work. Um, we're going to cut off the section, the question section right now, but really, really appreciate everyone um, who came and asked a question. We know that there are more that got one answered, so we'll take note of those. But if there are more questions or suggestions, you can email us at hello at sfparents.org and we're going to get um, a running list and um, try to make sure that everything, every single one of those is answered. Um, so just to um, looking ahead, so we did our budget survey this fall and we had nearly 800 responses and we got um, a lot of good information, um, specifically like there was differences between elementary schools, middle schools and high schools and there are different priorities and uh, keeping, mind, uh, keeping time in mind uh, would suggest you all to check that out on your own time. We'll of course send that out. And looking to uh, what's next, we are gonna be hosting a parents' night out on January 17th at Manny's, the same location as last time. Um, and you can RSVP, get more information on that QR code there, but of course we'll send that out as well. Um, but we really just wanna give you guys the space to meet as you know, parents, community members, and make it more uh, of, a, of a fun activity that we can all just attend and spend time together. So we hope to see you guys um, at that one. And of course, if there's anything else um, that you'd like to let us know, please uh, don't hesitate to email uh, to the hello account. And um, thank you so much, Anne-Marie and Carissa for making time for us today. I know that this was really, really helpful and we learned a lot about like the thought process behind how you guys are working on this. So thanks so much um, and appreciate all of you for coming today as well. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.